Welcome to Women Wednesdays. I'm Brandi Stitt, the program director for the Women's Business Center. And we're excited to have Erica Brune and Danielle Bearden with Lover One um, hosting an additional uh, HR related session for us. This is four of six. Next week, we'll be focusing on rehiring, recalling employees back to work. And then the following week, we'll be recruitment and hiring employees. And then we'll move on to some additional content topic areas starting July 15th. So at this time, I would like to mention that we're recording the session and we'll be posting these on our website. And I'd like to go ahead and hand things over to Erica Brune. Good morning. Thank you so much, Brandy, for having us today. And let me see if I can share my screen. There we go. Is that are we are we working? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much again for having us. My name is Erica Brune and I am president of Lover One. And joining me is our HR director, Danielle, and we're thrilled to have her today. Today we are focusing on one specific topic and doing a deep dive into it on how you can utilize this new relief uh, incentive and tax credit for your business as both a benefit to your employee and your business. And we are seeing that many business owners do not fully understand how advantageous this benefit can be for both the employee and the employer. So we're going to really deep dive into it and during this hour session on how to qualify employees for the leave, how, who is eligible, how to process it, and then how, of course, most importantly, to get those tax credits back from the government for your business. So um, that's what we're covering today, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and we'll refer to it as the FFCRA throughout this presentation. To give you a little bit of background, Danielle and I have both worked in HR for, for many, many years. And Lever One is an HR outsourced company. So we provide services to over 100 businesses, around 3,500 3, work site employees. And we're constantly working with them to consult on what their needs are. We've been very busy through this pandemic talking with them about their um, employees and the concerns they have, if they've had exposures, if they have illness, how to manage a remote workforce, and everything in between. And so today's presentation will be a culmination of all the information we've gained from working with employers in every industry across every state and sharing with you some of some of the, the best in class practices that we've seen and how uh, to be most effective in managing your employees through this very difficult time. <clears throat> Lever One is headquartered in Kansas City. We have 35 employees and um, we help clients with everything from payroll, HR, employee benefits, recruitment, a little bit of bookkeeping. And, and we really like to say we're everything your business isn't. So we have a really robust team here that's helped um, from a CPA to a, a compliance department helped us gather this information, which does change very, very rapidly. And we'll address that as we go through the different areas of this presentation. Okay, so let's jump right in. We've got one hour and this is a lot of information. So Danielle, this was, I think, the first, one of the first acts that got passed when the pandemic hit. Um, sooner than the PPP, which is a really big uh, employer uh, advantage loan, but the FFCRA came out first. Yeah. And a real shock to the system for employers that typically didn't have to worry about FMLA. Uh, many of our, and certainly in Kansas and Missouri, we don't mandate paid sick leave. So all of a sudden, it was a real shock to the system, well intended, but it, it instituted policies and procedures that you and I are really familiar with, but many small businesses in Kansas and Missouri have very little exposure to because they weren't required to offer any of these type of uh, employee benefits. So, so what exactly did they roll out? Yeah, so the US Department of Labor issued these temporary regulations under this Families First Coronavirus Response Act um, on April 1st. 
And so, or we will refer to this as the FFCRA today throughout our, our call and webinar. Um, but essentially what it is doing is requiring employees and employers to provide sick, well, employers to provide that sick leave and expanded FMLA to employees. In turn, the employees have to provide the appropriate documentation in order to utilize for those businesses with 500 employees or less. Um, for specified reasons related to COVID-19. Um, as Erica, as you had said, these were ever changing and, and still are the ins and outs and many questions uh, back in April that we had to jump through and uh, wait. You know, we were just as eager to hear uh, the answers to the questions we had as well as others. But essentially it's just that the FFCRA is a, a temporary regulation directly related to COVID to give staff uh, sick leave as well as expanded FMLA leave. All right, so who all is covered under this act? So there are two portions to this act and I wanna make that known right away because very often uh, when we talk about FFCRA, it's easy to get the two portions of it confused. But there is the emergency paid sick leave side, and then there is the expanded FMLA side. Um, at any rate, for the emergency paid sick leave, what we're talking about right at this juncture, um, all employees are eligible for this leave, given that your employer has 500 employees or less. Um, you know, federal employees also may be covered by the paid sick leave provision. Um, but what we know of as of today is all employees, as long as your uh, organization meets that threshold and they qualify, are, have the right to have this paid sick leave. Um, there is a portion of this paid sick leave that says, hey, if you have a small business with fewer than 50, you may qualify uh, for an exemption to be able to provide this leave due to school closings or different qualifying reasons on a case by case basis. And that's another area that we kind of dig into as well. And so then um, <clears throat> I think what's interesting is there are states and cities that already required employers to provide mandatory sick leave, even if they have part-time workers. So this has been a very hot topic debated uh, and every state and city has its own opinion on it, but um, what we knew even before COVID is that employers and employees technically, if they're sick, we don't want them to come to work. Employers struggle if they're small to say, I can't afford to pay people if they're not working. If they are not working, I have to replace them with someone else and pay that person. So I can't afford to pay two people. And that's been the biggest debate that we see as the individual cities or states have rolled out the paid sick leave prior to COVID. What, what happened here was the government said, okay, we know everyone has a different opinion on paid sick leave. We're going to cover it. We're going to pay for people. And it was interesting. This was, this was developed mid-March right when things were starting to shut down and happen. And at that point, they had already identified that 14 day window, right? Is, is the, either the, the, the period where you wanna self isolate or um, the potential uh, for transmission after you, know, you are cleared of symptoms to wait that 14 days. And so that's, that it's interesting that that, that 14 day window still was, was developed back in March and still pretty much exists today. But that this act was going to say, hey, I understand many small businesses can't afford to pay people when they're out sick. You don't want them to come to work and you're likely gonna have to pay somebody else to do that work, to cover that shift. We'll take the burden. We will reimburse you for it. And this will keep that employee as an active employed individual versus having to do a layoff, a no call, no show. You don't, you don't qualify for paid time off, therefore you're terminated. And, and, I, and I think it was a really smart move to say, Let's put this in place, help the employer, help keep the employee, but keep the employee home. Because we know that employees who um, need income typically go to work sick. So I think that's an interesting 
um, dynamic that that uh, certainly helps a small business owner like myself who truly can't afford to pay people if they're not working. All right, so uh, they did outline, and I think this this piece of it was outlined and, and stuck. Didn't really need to change too much as the situation unfolded. And this has been true from the beginning, but I think it's really interesting to, to dive into what specifically qualifies you for getting that paid sick leave. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And so while we talk about this emergency paid sick leave portion of the FFCRE, it's important to note that they, the employees have to be unable to telework um, in order to qualify for this leave and be eligible. Um, this leave would, would help those individuals who would be subject to a local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19, such as we saw with the several stay-at-home orders in multiple different municipalities and counties. Um, if you have been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine related to COVID-19, if you are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and are currently seeking a medical diagnosis, if you're caring for an individual subject to an order described in either the, the first two circumstances, if you're caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed or their child care is unavailable, for reasons directly related to COVID-19. And lastly, if, if you're experiencing any other substantially similar condition um, specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, um, all six of those are qualifying criteria in which an employee could be eligible for that emergency paid sick leave, and they have to be unable to telework as well. And we're going to take questions throughout and at the end, but I think that, what, as I said, it's very thorough, it hasn't changed, but it creates a lot of individual scenarios. We get a lot of calls on individuals and, okay, caring for the child um, is, is, a, is a good qualifying event for it, but what if they can also, what if they said, I can also telework and wanted to work, but then the, the kids are at home. And we saw a lot of that. And that put employers in, in a difficult situation. Danielle, what is, what, yeah, what are really, you advising people? It really did. I mean, you know, sometimes there's always a gray area uh, where we try to work through. The best we can say is to be flexible as much as you can. Um, for that specific circumstance you mentioned, Erica, you know, every circumstance is different with each employee. And so if they're able to telework despite, you know, their kids being there or, or being at home with their children or caring for an individual and they're doing it well, then that's awesome. And, and we want to work collaboratively with that staff member. But sometimes those tough conversations have to happen. Um, that while they think they, you know, may be able to telework and do it well, and sometimes that's not reality, and being able to have those transparent conversations with that staff member and knowing that, hey, you take the time you need. This is what it's there for, right? You qualify. It appears that you qualify. Um, let, let's take advantage of this if we can, right? And, and really important for both sides. I mean, these regulations have made it somewhat easier for the employer to uh, carry the burden of these these wages but then the employee to take the time they really need to get through this uh this trying time um but we have we had a lot of questions uh, pertaining to the very last qualifying criterion which says experiencing any other substantially similar <laughs> condition which is just kind of a catch-all that's telling you be flexible you know, where we can and, and, and certainly not to abuse it, but to, to really do your, take a good faith effort um, to mirror if these criteria applies to that specific employee circumstance. I think especially with the list of um, COVID effects or symptoms, it, it became almost any any symptom could potentially be related. Yeah. It's so so varied between people and, and grew throughout um, throughout the pandemic. So uh, great information. Okay, so let's say somebody meets one of these criteria. What is the paid benefit? 
Yeah, so under the emergency paid sick leave portion, your eligible employee meeting a qualified criteria will receive up to 80 hours or two weeks of paid sick leave. Um, now, dependent upon the reason in which they qualify for it would be the amount of pay that they receive, right? So for um, the first two, the pay would be different for those qualifying criteria rather than, uh, rather than the other lastly subject matters. Um, but important to note that this then is the first clause of um, the FFCRA. Once you get into these two weeks um, and that is paid out for the employee and they may qualify for the expanded med or family medical leave, which then kicks in after this. So this is kind of like the starter, so to speak, um, for, for those individuals. So this regular rate of pay uh, for 80 hours is available to those employees who are unable to work because the employee is quarantined and or experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis. The two weeks of paid sick leave for those qualifying employees um, are paid at two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay. Again, all of these, they have to be unable to telework um, and they would meet the qualifying criteria for caring for an individual subject to that quarantine, care for a child whose who's, uh, school or child care provider is closed or unavailable for reasons related to COVID-19 and or the employee is experiencing substantially similar conditions. So we have this broken out on the next slide uh, with a graph to kind of tell you all exactly what <laughs> show you what I was talking about. So we have that mapped out as the reason for the leave. So what criteria do they meet? And then what then would you pay them? And keep in mind it is capped, right? I mean, employees can't just um, make a substantial you know, amount while they're out. It is capped for, I mean, realistically uh, speaking, scenarios. So you see the quarantine or isolation order, the advice from your healthcare provider to self-quarantine, or if you're experiencing symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis, you're going to get your regular rate of pay um, up to 80 hours, capped at $511 per day. For the last three, if you're caring for an individual who's quarantined, caring for a child whose school is closed, or you're experiencing any other substantially similar condition, you can expect your pay to be two thirds of the regular rate capped at 200 daily. So when there were very few tests and it might be easier now, but we had a lot of questions from, okay, I have a fever, I have a cough, and my, but I'm a generally healthy, non-high risk person. I call my doctor and they say, you need to stay home unless things get worse, Etc. You need to self-isolate and stay home, but they they weren't actually going to test me, so I wasn't able to, to go out and get a test to prove that I was seeking a test or diagnosis. Uh, many people were just asked to stay home, just like you would if you had any other fever. So um, that that still did qualify. What did you recommend for that employer, that employer for documentation? Yeah, because when this first started, um, we were giving the guidance that doctor's notes are fine, right? This is normal procedures that we take. And then very early on, the CDC came out with, hey, employers should not be asking for doctor's notes just because of the practicality of receiving them. You know, uh, doctor's offices were inundated with um, you know, people who were ill, scared of having the virus, needing attention, and so realistically couldn't get them. Our advice then would be to work with that employee. If they're experiencing symptoms, the doctor has said to quarantine for 14 days, well, then that's what you should take, you know, kind of take into consideration. Pay them out the emergency paid sick leave. If they qualify and they can't telework, of course, um, and just, uh, so to speak, take them for their word. You know, there wasn't a time throughout this pandemic where we could say it's either a note or you don't get it. Um, it just, it wasn't the case. And employers really had to rely on that trust factor that they have with their staff and, and just um, putting that piece of humanity back in 
all right, we, we're going to have to get through this. And I tell you what, it's a lot safer on the front end to, to pay this and give them that um, without the doctor's note than it would be trying to, trying to fight it. And so in the end, our advice was, yes, just please work case by case basis with your staff, um, want them well. We also um, highly recommend that even if they're a, a, a generally non-high risk individual with a low fever, they still seek medical advice. And that sound, maybe that sounds um, obvious, but many people, when they're moderately ill, they don't feel terribly sick, do not go to the doctor. And so while we weren't mandating doctor's notes because we knew doctors just couldn't get to that, we would still highly encourage them to seek medical guidance um, on even a low grade fever and, and, and follow that guidance versus um, them just self-diagnosing and saying I'm self quarantining and all of that's great, but highly encourage them um, to, to consult a doctor um, and, and help navigate that so that they truly are getting the doctor's directions, even if it's not a written doctor's note. Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. <laughs> if you so it's, think it's obvious, but many, many people <laughs> um, did not necessarily seek, and they, they didn't want to go to the doctor, they didn't want to get out, they knew there were no tests, they didn't feel terrible, and so they still should be calling their doctor with any symptom, any COVID related symptom. All right, we're gonna move on to the second benefit within the FFCRA, the Expanded Family Medical Leave Act. And FMLA always has such a negative connotation for employers. It's like this huge red flag that it's nearly impossible to navigate. I hear many business owners say, I'm gonna stay under 50 employees, so I don't ever have to be subject to this. And the reality is, is it is not, it, it really does not have to be a detriment to the business. It really can be a benefit for employees that doesn't impede the success or operations of the business, but you have to navigate it with a, with a fine tooth comb. So what happened here is they said, we're gonna expand this to everybody under 500 employees, I believe, uh, even if you don't have 50 people, because we know this is a benefit that our workforce needs. And again, it gets back to, if we didn't do this, employers would have the right to terminate people. And, and again, not that that's always a bad thing, but they're gonna, the government realized they're gonna be paying these employees one way or another. If the employee term, if an employer terminates them, they're gonna go on unemployment and they'll get paid, or we can keep them employed. We can keep the workforce intact and offer this relief at the same rate and, and it, potentially and, and, and keep the workforce more intact. And so I, I, I encourage employers to really look at this option as a way to uh, facilitate the benefits directly to the employees without having to go through the layoff and termination um, scenarios if, if it's applicable. So Danielle, what is the Extended Family Medical Leave Act through the FFCRA? Yeah, so as you had said, it's an expansion of the current Family and Medical Leave Act. This differs in two ways, essentially, from the emergency paid sick leave. So remember how I said there are two portions of the FFCRA. This is the second one. This is the Expanded Family Medical Leave Act. Um, your employees will only be eligible if they have been employed for at least 30 days prior to his or her leave request. That's different from the emergency paid sick leave. Secondly, this Expanded Family Medical Leave Act only has one qualifying criteria to be eligible, and that is their minors, son or daughter's school or child care service must be closed or child care unavailable due to the COVID-19 emergency. So I like to call that out right away. This has two very different uh, criteria and factors in it that are right away different from the emergency paid sick leave. Um, so Essentially what this does, and we can get into the next slide as well, um, is that it allows employees, eligible employees, um, to qualify for uh, 10 weeks of partially paid leave if their child care is unavailable or school is closed. Essentially it's a 12 week uh, coverage and job protection, very similar to FMLA, 
However, the first 10 days of this leave are unpaid. So this is what I was talking about when we just were uh, looking at the emergency paid sick leave. One of the qualifying criteria for the sick leave is childcare unavailable. Same as emergency paid, uh, emergency medical leave or the expansion, I should say. So the first 10 days, quite possibly the employee could qualify for the sick leave and that would cover this 10 days of it under this provision being unpaid. And then the 10 weeks of partially paid leave is an av available thereafter. Important to note on these first 10 days, if they don't qualify or what have you, they can use their time off that they have. Maybe you have a wonderful PTO program or another sick leave option. Several states mandate specific state leaves. This is the time they can use that. Um, you may not require the use of it though, however, um, but you can use that option if you'd like. After the initial 10 days, the additional 10 weeks of partially paid EFMLA is available for that qualifying employee. You can take this on an intermittent basis. So you can either take for the employee side a full 10 weeks, uh, one robust period of time, or you can take it intermittently. You know, lots of times I think uh, employees are trying to juggle uh, their life and their work and taking care of the kids and still having their career. Maybe they can work a few days in the office and, and not, or maybe they uh, can work a, a few tele, not telecommuting and take care of their kids on the other. So really being able to work with those employees. Um, so employers must pay those employees two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay in this case for these 10 weeks of partially paid EFML, EFMLA um, is based on the number of hours the employees would have otherwise been scheduled to work and they're capped at 200 a day or 10,000 total. You can also require the use of company provided paid time off uh, to supplement if you'd like instead of the two thirds amount of pay should the company leave exhaust any of the FMLA time. So an employee comes down with COVID, they would get the paid sick leave and then they would not qualify for leave after those 80 hours, the two weeks. They could qualify for traditional FMLA if the employer had over 50 employees within the geographic mm -hmm. parameters of traditional FMLA, which is an unpaid benefit. But um, uh, after the 80 hours of paid sick leave, technically that if an employee had COVID, they would not have additional paid relief through this act. Um, yeah. And so at that point, the employer would have the very difficult situation of, again, hopefully there was some paid time off or some other benefits that had been accrued. But then in the reality, there would be a time where termination would potentially be discussed. And that's very difficult. Um, as great as some of these reliefs are, it, it, that, um, you know, that, that's where that lies. Whereas we know there are plenty of people who are caring for children. And, um, and that's what this particular uh, leave and expanded leave covers because it is not a coverage in the traditional FMLA. Uh, you can care for a sick relative, but this isn't, this isn't related to that. This is just, hey, I've got three kids at home. I have no childcare available. And I have a position, let's say, in a, uh, a front facing, you know, I, I, there's no possible way for me to telework due to the, let's say it's a hospitality position. Um, therefore, I need this leave. I have literally nowhere to send my children. And so I think that's interesting is that it feels that it's a little, um, short-sighted for those that are ill, but on the flip side, this is something truly designated to, for those um, workers that we knew were gonna be without care all summer long. And that's what this was implemented for in, in mid-March. So it's very interesting, um, pros and cons to it. Okay, well, on this next slide, this was probably what <laughs> Danielle and I spent, or at least me, I spent the most time on was, okay, I help business owners and these business owners in most cases, now you've got the professional services like a marketing firm or a law firm and they can work from home, tel telework. And we're seeing some businesses say that they're seeing increased productivity. 
not in all cases, but some remarkably are able to, to telework and be more productive. And the employers are, employees are thriving in that environment. But there is a majority of the workforce in hospitality, medical, construction, when you, those workers need to be on site doing the work. There is no work for them to be done via telework. And so these employers immediately said, this, these acts under the FFCRA and these relief um, mechanisms are wonderful. I'm not worried about paying someone who's sick, the money side of it, which is what we've been focused on. I cannot operate my business if the workers don't show up to work. So I, while this is great, a way to get me some tax credits to cover the, the hours, that's not my concern. My concern is I can't run my business. I'm a small construction crew. I cannot run it and meet deadlines and finish projects and get uh, paid if my workforce doesn't show up. So I want to be exempt from the FFCRA. And unlike the qualifications for FFCRA, the exemption for FFCRA did not come. It did not come on April 1st when the act took place. And so employers were panicked and scrambling trying to say, who is exempt? Who gets exempt? I cannot run my business with this act. What is the application? Where do I go to fill out the exemption? What are the qualifications? And unfortunately, they did not come on April 1st. They did come a week or so later, and it was a total change to what we originally thought. We are not going to exempt an entire business. We are going to exempt individuals within that business, that qualifying business, on a case-by-case -case basis. And that was not at all what we saw coming. We thought, hey, you're in construction, you're exempt. Hey, you're in um, medical, you're exempt. And the reality was that the guidance after it was intact in said, let's look at this case by case. And, and Danielle, talk us through how you advise business owners to do that. Yeah, so that you're right. That was a kind of a crazy time where we initially <laughs> thought, okay, well, the whole company would be exempt and we're right. going to just make sure you... Uh, keep the documentation. We don't know exactly what documentation you'll need yet, but keep on to that. And um, we quickly learned, well, that's not, not the case. So for those individuals and those staff members, the best example I can give is, let's say you have a very small business and in your department are two individuals, right? One um, is out on this leave for qualifying purposes. And the other submits a need for this leave and you are under the threshold of employees to qualify for this exemption. And the other employee uh, submits a request for this leave. This is a prime example of an, uh, when you use the case by case basis exemption. It would con cause undue hardship on your organization. You could not continue operations. And so that's a prime example of when you can utilize your exemption uh, for on a case by case basis. The FFCRA also came out with exceptions for small employers with fewer than 25 saying that, okay, you won't be obligated to reinstate an employee at the end of their leave um, to care if they're caring for their son or daughter whose school or place of care was closed. If you can meet all four hardship conditions. Now I, I will be honest for you. It, it, I always like to say, gosh, if we can give them their job back, something similar, something consistent, we always want to try to do that. But they also came out with um, an exception that say, hey, you, okay, you won't be obligated to reinstate them if you meet the following four conditions, so to speak. And if the position is no longer uh, exists due to the pandemic, if the employer made reasonable efforts to restore the employee to the same or equivalent, the employer makes reasonable efforts to contact an employee if they, you know, an equivalent position becomes available. And if the employer continues to make reasonable efforts to contact the employee for one year, beginning either on the date of the leave or, um, or the date 12 weeks after the employee's leave began, you know, um, I think oftentimes, <clears throat> even with uh, the regular FMLA, we had a hard time and companies have a hard time getting that employee back. 
And this is just to say, okay, you won't be obligated to do that under this exception, but you have to make sure all four reasons are checked off your list. Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to make mention of that too, because that was something newer that came out. And, and like you said, Erica, you know, we, we waited too to kind of get uh, definitions of what their intent was. You know, people read these different ways. Um, but specifically speaking to your question, yes. I mean, case by case basis. And of course, this doesn't involve the healthcare industry. This is speaking of other industries where, um, you know, you meet the threshold of less than 50 and, and it's going to cause an undue hardship on you. There are a few other exceptions it looks like as well. Yeah, so this is what we were talking about. Um, you know, with fewer than 50s, exemptions on a case-by-case -case basis. And this is what you were talking about and I kind of chimed in there. A small business, you can claim this exemption on a case-by-case -case basis, such as the example I shared. And these are the reasons that you have to um, make sure you keep document of and you have an authorized officer of your business that has determined such and confirms that, okay, the provision of this um, paid sick leave or expanded FMLA would result in the small businesses expenses and financial obligations exceeding revenues. Um, the absence of the employee or employees requesting this leave would entail a substantial risk to their financial health or operation capabilities. Or that and there are not sufficient workers who are able, willing and qualified. So that kind of loops into my example I gave you of the two staff members in a department. One is already gone, the other is requesting it. You know, this would fall under, um, would that entail a substantial risk to operational capabilities? In most cases, that answer would be yes. And so um, th there you would use the exemption or would be able to use the exemption, I should say. Okay, and then um, we talked about Healthcare is also exempt, and here is a pretty expansive list because that could be so um, wide. Yeah. Yes, we waited on this one. It seemed like a very long time. Um, we had several in this sector and in this industry, and it was just in a limbo waiting to, to hear, okay, what is your definition? Please define to me what you're going to consider healthcare provider. And so they finally, the DOL came out with, okay, um, these are all of the, the entities in which may fall under that umbrella. And this is incredibly expansive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any similar institution, you know, it's very, very expansive in, in who this will cover. <clears throat> and this slide just kind of talks about, um, those emergency responders and healthcare workers. And the DOL encourages employers just to be really judicious when it comes to using these definitions to exempt emergency responders or healthcare workers from the provisions of the FFCRA. So there's a little more room for discretion there with the employer. These types can choose to allow the paid sick leave and the expanded FMLA in certain circumstances or for a shorter periods of time. There is some wiggle room there when it comes to those spe specific industries. All right, we are gonna get into our most commonly asked question segment of this presentation, but I do wanna remind our participants that there is a chat feature if you hover over the uh, navigation bar, uh, feel free to add a question in the chat and we will get to that through uh, the rest of this presentation. Okay, Danielle, so here, here are some of our most commonly asked questions. <laughs> Would an employee who is afraid of coming to work and contracting COVID-19 be eligible for paid sick leave? No. <laughs> um, an employee's concern for out of contracting the virus is not within the six criteria for qualifying for that leave. They might be eligible for another leave. You might extend, if you have a personal leave or something of that nature, accrued vacations to extend to them in that case. Um, but ultimately, no, they wouldn't fall under the emergency paid sick leave. Um, now, if they have a serious health condition, if they're at high risk, uh, you might be eligible for the traditional FMLA leave, 
And it's just really important to, again, have that collaborative dialogue with your staff to determine, okay, well, you may not qualify for this, but what else might be available to you? Early on, we this was absolutely the number one uh, most asked question. There are many, rightfully so, employees afraid to go to work. If they're working in a restaurant, if they're working at the grocery store, gas station, uh, uh, any a doctor's office where they are going to be in constant contact, nobody understood. You think back to March, what was going to happen, what was going on, and for any number of reasons, everyone seemed to have a slightly different reaction to what their comfort zone was, and that may have been based on their home environment. That may have been based on, like you said, some. Um, high risk situations based on their personal medical history that employers typically don't know about and shouldn't know about. Um, and so you never re really know what is behind the scenes for that individual employee circumstance. But this was everywhere. I'm, I, I, do you have children at home that you need to care for? No, not necessarily. Do you have a fever? I mean, that would be the first thing. Are you experiencing symptoms? No, no, no. Nope. I just, I'm, I just don't think I should come in. I'm just fearful. And the employer's put in a terrible situation on, is this a voluntary resignation then? Um, because these, these leaves don't technically cover fear. And now fast forward to where we're at today, mid June, we're still seeing this slightly different though. It's not, Hey, I'm just afraid to come in. Now it's so-and-so in the office may have been exposed. They're gonna self quarantine, yet you've got every other employee in the office who now may be afraid because of that potential exposure. And half of the time, these aren't even tested yet. They're getting tested, we're seeking the diagnosis, or the test then comes back negative, hopefully. But that creates a whole new level of fear as people are back in the work environment. Because now as it's spreading, people are becoming ill in the workplace, of course. And so now we're seeing that as an additional fear and employers just have a very difficult um, uh, navigation road to figure out how many levels of exposure before you shut the office back down or before you do any other safety protocols, certainly when it's hasn't even been a confirmed case, right? And so those are the questions that we are getting every single day and they're real, they're, they're difficult. Um, Danielle, what's your advice on that? So again, those are going to be know your staff, know your staff um, and take the time to talk with them. Um, but outside of that, on a case by case basis with the staff members, you know, they don't wanna come back, they're fearful. I think in one of the webinars before this one, we just said and really stressed the importance of communication. Um, that was one of our number one areas that could help your employees feel better. Um, continuing to communicate what you're doing as a business to safeguard them and to really care for um, their well being inside the workplace. Proper cleaning, disinfecting techniques. Uh, your policies on possible exposures, your return to work programs, you know, what they can expect. But essentially, each employee is going to be a little different. Um, we've had several employee consults on those people who are fearful of coming back and they're at high risk. In those cases, we're going to recommend that you are a little bit flexible with those people in the return to work phases. You know, give them a little more leeway if they're at high risk of contracting the virus or, or if they are caring for um, you know, a child whose child care is out. So extending some, um, some flexibility there. Uh, for those staff members who don't fall under any of those, they don't, they're not at high risk, they're not caring for um, a child or child care is unavailable and they're just scared and don't wanna come back and um, it's not a critical, you know, especially if it is, I'm sorry, a critical infrastructure or an essential business. Sometimes you have by no means other than we're going to have to accept your voluntary resignation. Now, I will say every state is very different now. 
with how this works and how it interplays with uh, unemployment. Um, but what I always say is work with that employee. And if, if you have, if you do come to a par part in the road where it is a accepting voluntary resignation, please follow that up with, we welcome to be back in touch with you or you in touch with us if circumstances should change. We understand this is a crazy time and people are scared. Um, but there are those cases where it just boils down to having to uh, temporarily, we hope, part ways and revisit when circumstances change. Okay, very good. All right, how and when do employers apply for the tax credit? So we've talked all about who qualifies, what it is, but how does, how does the mechanics of it work? How do I get me as the employer the money back in my bank account? Yeah, so the, it is a dollar for dollar tax credit. And so like we started out saying, this is, you know, if you can take advantage of this, this is really comfort for the employer and, you know, having to kind of front those wages. So employers, if you paid that leave up front, you'll take a dollar for dollar tax credit by retaining that amount through payroll taxes um, equal to the amount of the qualified stick or child care leave that you paid. Plus, you have the qualified health plan expenses and the employer's share of Medicare tax, um, rather than deposit them with the IRS. So this was also effective uh, April 1st, 2020. Okay, you're going to pay out these wages. We're asking you to pay them out, but guess what? You're going to get those back dollar for dollar through your payroll. Um, payroll taxes that are available for retention, um, there were two clauses. Um, also within the employer tax credits that you could take if you didn't choose um, the FFCRA route. And that's what this talks about here. But they include withholding federal income taxes through the employee's share of Social Security and Medicare and the employer's share of Social Security and Medicare with respect to all of those employees. And then the uh, equivalent child care leave and sick leave amounts um, were also made available to those self-employed individuals under circum similar circumstances. And even today, more guidance is still moving from the IRS on that. So for those of you that are processing payroll, that is the mechanism where you obtain these credits. Depending on what payroll software you use, as you start your payroll batch, you should be looking for or identifying new pay codes, paid sick leave or extended family medical leave. Those two leaves that we've been addressing in this webinar should be new pay codes in your payroll batch. So what I mean by that is when you enter wages, you typically select regular hours as a pay code, overtime hours, bonus, vacation, sick time. And if you're not separating all of those out, I highly encourage you to do so. There are a lot of benefits and reasons to know, even if it nets to the same dollar amount, was that employee in the office or was that paid time off? Because that all calculates to overtime differently. There's just a lot of different advantages to taking that little extra effort and entering the wages for each employee in the appropriate pay code in whatever software program you're using. Same applies here. If you accurately say, I am paying 10 hours or 40 hours of paid sick leave for employee A, and you use that specific pay code, depending on your payroll software, that should automatically calculate and track and short pay the payroll taxes for that payroll batch. So it is intended to be an immediate reimbursement for the employer. In addition, when you go to file your quarterly 941 reconciliation, there is a new form and it already is created. And on that form, there are now new categories for paid sick leave credits and paid extend, extended family medical leave credits. So it walks step by step on how to get you back your money immediately. Now, I make it sound easier than it is. That is very complex especially when we're talking about what Danielle said, 80% of the wages or two thirds of the wages or this tax, but not federal unemployment tax, right? That was not included. So 
There is also out there on the 941, the worksheet now, uh, that's a full page sheet that walks you through how to make sure you've calculated that correctly as part of that reconciliation. So it is already out there before, um, if it went into effect April, that means second quarter, um, the 941 would be due at the end of next month, end of July, where you'll start walking through that and, um, and submitting that. But in theory, if your payroll company is set up correctly, you've already received the benefit because you haven't been making those tax deposits. You've been taking the credit there. If for some reason you did not know about that, you can still make corrections and get that corrected on your 941. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, for, for more information on that if you don't have uh, a, a payroll. I, I understand some people you know, do this still maybe more in-house or things like that, depending on the size of your business. But the reality is, if done correctly, there is no out-of-pocket expense for the employer. And in fact, now they're paying the employer portion of the medical coverage. So it's even more than just the wages that is an advantage to the employer here. So I highly recommend that you um, use the correct pay codes in your payroll software and confirm you're getting that rebate and that tax credit in real time. And please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need more specific guidance based on um, which payroll company you're using. All right, last question. Are uh, nonprofit organizations required to comply with the FFCRA? Yeah, so they are private nonprofit employers with fewer than 500 employees are included as being covered under, um, under the FFCRA. And um, I know there are several other industries as well, but short answer to that one is yeah. Okay. And I was, uh, I lied, it's not the last question, it's the next question. <laughs> the next question is, if an employee takes FMLA leave for his or her own serious health condition related to COVID-19, is the employee eligible for this new category of paid FMLA leave? I know, this all intertwines, it certainly does. And when we talk about uh, the expanded FMLA, FMLA versus the FMLA leave, you know, how to, how to navigate that, and especially for your own serious health condition related to COVID-19. So the new paid FMLA leave entitlement is for one reason only, such as I said, to care for child care. So should an employee, however, like leave, um, you know, develop um, health care provider self-quarantine orders or experiencing symptoms, and they're going to be eligible for that emergency paid sick leave. But no, the new paid FMLA leave entitlement is really for just one reason only, um, to care for those individuals with no child care, son or daughter, I should say. Okay. Are part-time employees included in the expanded family medical leave and paid sick leave? They are. Um, again, you have to be sure that you've been employed for 30 days um, prior to his or her leave request. Um, any employee is eligible regardless of the length of employment. And also, I mean, just a reminder as what we talked about in the beginning of this, you might also have a listing of another qualifying event in both cases. So you can essentially qualify for both of these, the emergency paid sick leave and the expanded FMLA. So a part-time worker, we are going to pay them what they were scheduled to work. If I had them scheduled for 15 hours, that's the benefit they would get for that week. Yeah, if you're going to average it out, that's the benefit they're going to get. Those 10 weeks of partial payment would be at two-thirds of their regular rate of pay um, or at minimum wage, whichever is higher. If we offer telework as an option and an employee wants to take the leave instead, can they do that? No, if telework is available and it's an option, then you, you have to take it. If they're unable to perform the telework now because of childcare is unavailable, then that's a different story, right? Then that, then they would qualify for. Um, but if they're able to telework while caring for their child, then this leave is not going to apply. That brings us to the end of our presentation. I believe we have answered all the questions in the chat. I'm reviewing that now. Um, and so we will stay on for another minute, just to ensure that there aren't any other questions, but I want to thank everyone 
for joining us today. And as a reminder, the FFCRA is in place through the end of 2020. Could it be extended? We, uh, we, time will tell. But it is in place through the end of December, which gives us another six months for some of these circumstances to arise. So don't, don't think that this was just in the, you know, the, the first part of COVID. You may have someone who has, uh, we may face another child care coverage issue later this year. And these acts are still in place and still available if the employee hadn't used them already. So um, even though it seems like people are reopening, it seems like the, we heard on the news last night, schools seem like they're probably going to reopen or moving in that direction things could change. They could change on an individual basis with someone being ill, or they could change with um, schools opening and then all of a sudden they shut down, or let's say it's one city or one childcare facility that has an outbreak and shuts down. These uh, are still going to be available through the rest of the year. And I hope that we, I know there's a lot of details to this, but our goal was just to make you aware that these are advantageous for both the employee and the employer. And I hope that was your takeaway today. With uh, questions as these situations arise for you and your business, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our information is on the screen um, it, between now and the end of the year and, and even thereafter, because I'm sure there will be some sort of continuation or additional coverages that help uh, protect employees and employers alike. So thank you so much for joining us today and please join us again at a future uh, Women Wednesday session. Thanks all, take care.